I'm Logan Crawford, and right now on Spotlight, we're speaking with author Glenn Cook. He is a man behind an awesome book called Rules for Rulers Who Don't Know the Rules. And he is sharing invaluable lessons that he learned the hard way with a keen focus on avoiding common mistakes and learning from problem solving experiences. This book is an indispensable guide for leaders seeking to make informed decisions and to rule and lead the right way. We are delighted to have Glenn join us here today on Spotlight. We thank the team at Sweet Spire Literature Management for helping us put him in the spotlight today. And we ask viewers like you to support writers like him by subscribing to our channel. Glenn, great to see you here today on Spotlight. I am honored. The honor is all mine, sir. Are rules for other people, are there rules when it comes to leading? Should you make up your own rules? Should you break the rules? Let's talk about rules a little bit. One of the most important rules that I was taught was when I was in the U.S. Navy and I was a, being evaluated to be a nuclear weapons security guard supervisor. And I walked in, I sit at the table, I've got the captain, the XO, the weapons officer, the gunnery division officer, and the captain asked me, give me an example of when you would throw out the rule book. Mm -hmm. And I came up with one. And at the end of the interview, I went out, waited, and there was three of us that were applying for the position. And I got it because my throw out the rule book scenario was the best of the three. Mm -hmm. The other two guys had said, well, I would never get rid of the rule book. And I said that if we had a hazmat spill, I can't wait to run everything up and get permission. I started the, I would start the cleanup as soon as it happened. Exactly. And so, so there are times for rules and times when you have to break the rules. And I guess the wisdom and the magic is knowing the difference, right? Yes. That is it largely can be an experience thing. It can be an observation thing where you saw somebody else do something wrong. And as I say in the book, one of the ways people learn is, oh, I don't want to ever do that. <laughs> Exactly. Everybody don't like, don't let this happen to you, basically. Yes. Yeah. Don't let it happen to me. <laughs> I'm the poster child for that. Do not let this happen to you. And there's all arrows around me. But yeah. <laughs> what is, would you say, one important rule that every ruler should follow? I can't give you one, but I'll give you two. Perfect. Your subordinate people under you need to be prepared to step into your shoes. Mm -hmm. You've got to train them to handle that emergency. And the second one is the more time you spend planning for an emergency, the less time you're going to spend trying to figure out what to do. When the Back in the 1970s, I think it was, there was two 747s that collided in the Canary Islands. And there was a husband and wife sitting in the airplane. And the husband was a fireman and very much used to thinking out scenarios. And when the planes hit, the wife grabbed the seat in front of her and froze. And the husband looked over at her tapped her on the shoulder. She looked at me and says, you can let go now. Let's get off the plane. As they were walking off the plane, they were passing seats where people were still frozen watching them. You're going to do one of three things in an emergency. If you have an action plan, you put that plan into motion. Second thing is you'll freeze. You don't know what to do. You've never been there and you're waiting for somebody else to direct you. The third thing that you can do is what I call bounce between doors. 
Do I go out the front door? Do I go out the back door? Do I go out the front door or the back door? You got to make a decision. The sooner you make a decision, the sooner you can get moving, the better off your survival odds are. And the kicker on this is if you can't save you, you can't save anybody else. Exactly. You've got to put the oxygen mask on yourself first or you stay on airlines. Yes. Mike Tyson also infamously says everybody has a plan until you get punched in the face. So yes. it's basically expect the unexpected. You have your plan and that's the plan you're going to follow. But you never know when the unexpected like that punch in the face is going to happen. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yes, sir. Who did you write this book for and give the folks at home an overview of what it's about? 1970, or sorry, not 19, 2003, TSA was getting up and running. I joined on and I was observing things and my oldest daughter was getting into dating. And I would kind of come home and talk about observations I'd made. And she would talk about the lack of decent husband material. And I started writing down little thoughts. And it became 10 sentences for newly promoted personnel. Mm -hmm. I had a lead officer that I was supposed to follow whose sole reason she was a lead is I have a four-year college degree, so obviously I'm qualified. You can manage buildings, you can manage accounts, animals, cars, herds, tires, take your choice. But to quote Grace Hopper, captain, inventor of the COBOL computer language, you have to lead people. People have to be led. And so we got these discussions going and I wrote this little page up in 10 sentences and gave it to a couple of newly promoted people and it was well received. Well, as time went on, it became 20 sentences. And then um, it became 50 sentences. And I had two managers come over to me and ask me for a copy of it on separate times. So I printed out a copy and gave it to them. Didn't think anything of it. And that was 2003, 2004 time frame, I think. Mm -hmm. And by the time I got done... It is 2023, and the book just came out, but it is over a thousand paragraphs or sections on things to think about. Don't do a uniform inspection if your uniform looks bad. Right. Uh, I live in Florida. If I have to evacuate from Florida... I want to go at least 100 miles away into another state. That way I can let people know that my family is safe and I'm not in the danger zone. The emergencies that you're going to face, the leadership that you're going to need, depends on where you're at. Florida doesn't have earthquakes. It has hurricanes. California has earthquakes, but it doesn't have that many blizzards. Michigan and New York have blizzards. So if you're preparing for something, the better prepared you are, the better you're going to be when the emergency happens. This FEMA did a study after Hurricane New uh, Katrina smacked New Orleans rather smartly. Mm -hmm. And the survival number, if people are in that area and the government can't get into that area, a major, a major earthquake in California for 60 days, the survival number was like 6.4%. Hmm. If you're in downtown Los Angeles, downtown Miami, the number goes down to 4.5 because there's no food, no water, and 99% of the population has no training. If you go to a state like Nebraska, Indiana, Illinois, out in the boonies, then it goes up to 
but a large part of that is your preparation. The big thing that most men can't do, they don't know how to skin an animal anymore. Right. And it's those simple little survival things that can help you. And so I wrote the front of the book and each section is labeled and each paragraph or idea has a number to it. And it's up to like 1,100 different ideas. Um, the first idea is don't shoot the messenger or the author. <laughs> exactly. That's good advice. All of your advice is great advice. It's a difference between being a boss and being a leader, you know, because leaders, like you said, train their subordinates to take over. And that's very, very important. And to be prepared for an emergency because we never know when it's going to happen. And try to take a little time away from this and start learning things like hunting and maybe skinning and building a fire. And uh, we might be a little bit better off in this society. God forbid it were to collapse, right? Right, Glenn? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Well, your time in the Navy has served you well. Obviously, you had a lot of responsibility working with nukes. So uh, you had to know the rules and you have literally now written the book. It is called Rules for Rulers Who Don't Know the Rules. It is wonderful. It is great food for thought. It is a book that should be on every person's let, bookshelf. Let me, Glenn, go ahead, my friend. Let me add one thing. The question I've been asking since the 1950s, I was a Boy Scout. I get one in a hundred that know the right answer. Okay. How many verses are in the national anthem? That I couldn't tell you. There is four. What is needed to be learned is the first verse, what you sing at every event, is a question. The fourth verse is the answer. And it starts, thus be it ever when free men shall stand between loved home and war's desolation, blessed with victory and peace, may the heaven rescued land give praise to the power that has made and preserved us a nation. As an American, you should know the fourth verse by heart. You should never ask the question. Amen. And uh, I will know it now. Three things I take pride in. Mm -hmm. My comment on the national anthem. Yep. Paragraph 17 on what does it mean to be an American? Mm -hmm. If you haven't read it, take a minute. Okay. And on page 275 starts an article called Bedtime Genius. My oldest daughter was accepted to college at 14. Hmm. And I had her doing chemistry at five, algebra of the fourth grade. And there's a whole bunch of advice in there. If you got grandkids, any historical story or event makes for a good bedtime story. You get a fourth, fifth, sixth grade book on social studies, copy the history, use that for bedtime stories at three, four, five, six. When they get to that grade, it's an easy eight. Sounds great. And you got a captive audience at that point, and then their brain will marinate the words that you gave them while they're sleeping. Yes. That's perfect, for sure. Glenn, thank you so much for joining us here today on Spotlight. My honor, sir. The honor Have is a good day. I enjoyed speaking with you. The honor is all mine. And to the folks at home, I'm Logan Crawford, thanking you for your time this time. Until next time on Spotlight.